in chapter 2. We're going to be reading the letter to the church at Thyatira, Revelation 2, verse 18 through 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immoral immorality. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, that you do not hold this teaching, or who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them. I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, so I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. A lot of people don't like reading Revelation. They don't like teaching Revelation or studying Revelation. And it gets too symbolic, to this, to that. I disagree 100%. I heard many older pastors and have read in many commentaries written by these men that they wish they had preached on Revelation more often. And I take you to verse 3 of chapter 1 that was read at our Breaking of Bread service. Blessed is he who reads, and to those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are in it, for the time is near. The Lord offers a blessing to those who read it and to those who hear it. I don't know of any other book in the Bible that offers that blessing, but yes, I understand we are blessed every time we open God's word. And if you can start your day with only one verse, please do. I highly recommend it. Um, this is the fourth of the seven letters in the book of Revelation. It's the longest of the seven letters, most verses, and it's to the smallest church in the smallest city. Thyatira is what we would call a blue-collar town. For those of you from the Midwest, you understand what a blue-collar town is. We actually work for a living, unlike some people who don't play with computers and use their minds and stuff. We actually, Tom and Steve know this because I've watched them do the kitchen over there. And Steve is really good with a sledgehammer, I got to tell you. He's really good. It's a working man's town. In a working man's town, there's going to be many what the Bible calls trade guilds. It's a union. Um, being a member of the plumber's union, I had to be because that's the trade I took up in a big city. You had to be or you did not work. Um, in order to work at your chosen trade back then, you had to be a member of that particular trade guild. Um, you got to abide by the rules. Believe it or not, even today, unions have very strict rules. Believe it or not, they try to tell you who you can vote for. And I won't tell you what side of the aisle they go to, but it's, that's my left hand here, okay? There are a few that aren't, that don't go that way, but the majority do. Um, it's wherever these guilds were found, wherever these unions were found, there was idolatry and immorality. Each one had their own gods. Each one had their own festivities, parties, and rules. Idolatry and immorality were two of the biggest problems for the early church. And are they any different today? What is idolatry? Idolatry is anything that you put above God, anything that takes the place of your worship of God, be it work, your kids, your spouse, money, house, the new Corvette that somebody's going to get. Anything. Uh, the unions controlled your social, political, economic, and the religious life in, in the cities for these people back then. Um, they would have their own little parties and festivities. Um, 
equate it to probably something like you would see in a, Hol in a Hollywood or a celebrity party today. Um, as you read through scriptures, you will understand the immorality and the things that they did. And they did it to make it fun. If it wasn't fun, people understand this, guys. If sin wasn't fun, nobody would do it, would they? But it's a lie. We know that it catches up in the end, and, and it's bad. We, we all know this. Um, this is the first book, um, you know, the only place in Revelation where the title, the Son of God, is used. And the situation in this church required that Jesus Christ reaffirm his deity, tell him who he was. They needed to understand his complete holiness. He had eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze. His eyes were piercing, penetrating to the very core, separating the bones from the marrow. Holy and righteous, perfect knowledge. Nothing escaped his sight, nothing escaped his knowledge or his wisdom. Bronze or brass is used in scripture to signify judgment. And that judgment is complete and total. He's telling him, I see you. I know what you're doing. I know what you're thinking. And I'm going to judge you for it. He says, I know your deeds and your love and your faith and your servants and your perseverance. And that you are doing more that you used, than you used to. They're growing. They're doing more. You know, if the letter stopped right there, you'd think that was a pretty good church, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like the Lord to tell you that you're growing and all that? And we should be growing in all that. We should be being conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of those things are something that he showed us. But the Lord finds a lot to expose and condemn in the church. No amount of Love, no amount of sacrificial works, no amount of service in the Lord's name can make up for compromising the truth. You can't do it. You can't tolerate evil. If you let evil in, evil will stay. Evil will grow. Sin will grow. If you compromise the truth, all of a sudden, you're going to be out here, and you're going to have that much falsehood in. It doesn't stay still. It grows. And it grows exponentially. You might not think so, because it comes in so slow and, and quiet and easy. You know, the devil's not stupid. He can't send somebody in here or somebody into your life with a bunch of lies that you know are untrue. But it puts a little itty bitty seed there. Once that plants, we all know what a seed does, right? It grows. And that's something we need to watch out for. Immorality and idolatry were being taught and practiced. Hard to think of a church, an early church, so soon after the Lord Jesus Christ was here that they would already be in immorality and idolatry, but yet they are. Is there any different today? No. If anything, it's probably worse today. As, far, as hard as it is to believe that we could be worse than some of the things we read about in Scripture, we are worse. Sin didn't stop back there. Sin just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. I don't know, you'd have to be pretty blind or living under a rock if you can't see the evil that's in this world. Everywhere you go. Can you go anywhere that you don't see evil? Can you go anywhere that evil is not front and center shoved in your face other than coming here? By here, I mean a church among believers. You can't even go to the grocery store. You can't go out in your yard. One of your neighbors is probably doing something wrong or somebody walking down the street. It's everywhere. It says the church was permitting a false prophetess named Jezebel to teach and lead the people into compromise. She was teaching them to commit acts of immorality, the adultery part, and to eating food sacrificed to idols. It's very similar to verse 14 in the letter to the church at Pergamum. But I have a few things against you, because you have those who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who, keep teaching, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. It wasn't just one single church where this was happening. Understand, I should have opened with this, and I didn't. There's uh, three ways to really look at, at 
uh, church letters to the churches in Revelation. It was written to the actual church in this particular time period, in this first century. It was written to a cover a period of church history. And it's written to us today. Why? Because every single problem in every single one of these letters is present in every single church in America and throughout the world. You might not think it is. Each of you knows your own heart. Each of you knows your own mind. I can't read or see your mind or your heart. But I know the evil that resides in me. Remember, we all have that old sinful nature still. And it bubbles up to the surface at times, usually at the most inopportune time. And it comes up very unexpectedly. And it's something we need to guard against. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Very true. But sometimes we try to take control. And when we take control, that's the old sinful nature coming up. It happens. The name Jezebel should be very familiar to readers of this letter. Um, it was perhaps the wickedest woman in all of Scripture. Um, she enticed the Israelites and King Ahab to lead them into Baal worship. And if you want to know more about evil, evil woman, read it for, about her in First and Second Kings. Um, she's not a person I would name a daughter after, but that's me. I've read the true story. Some of them may not have. But just as the first Jezebel led God's people astray, this Jezebel was doing the same thing. She was teaching the believers how to compromise their beliefs with those of the false religions of the different various trade guilds or unions. And they were teaching them to fit into the world so that they could keep their jobs, keep their lifestyle, keep their money, in some cases, keep their lives. When I was teaching the youth group, uh, high school, junior high kids, I always told them, do not make the Bible fit into the world. Make the world fit into the Bible. If you do that, you will never go wrong. You'll always know the right way to take. But it's very easy to get out of it. I mean, there's, I'm not going to say this church because I know better. I know most of you personally. But most of these mega churches and big churches, people have never opened a Bible in their life. They go there to be entertained. They go there to hear what their itching ears want to hear. Scripture tells us that's what they're going to do. And that's what they're hearing. They're there to get entertained. They're here to... You ever heard somebody say, I went to church today and I feel so good about it. I have never left church after hearing a message that I feel good about myself. Because I know how bad I am and I know how far short I fall of the glory of God. I know that. There is no good that resides within me. I know this. The only good resides in me is the Lord Jesus. That's it. Nothing else. I can do no good as of, on my own. None of us can. Maybe she told them that by doing so, they would advance the cause of the church. You know what? Let's change our music. Let's turn it into a rock band. Let's, uh, let's sing some songs that nobody knows the words. You ever wonder about our hymns? It's not the music that's so pleasing to the Lord. It's the words. It's the praise and worship of the Lord in the words of the song or of the hymn. When they play some of this Christian stuff on the radio, I can't understand a single word of it. How is that separate from the world? How is that pleasing to the Lord? But it's what the world wants to hear. It's what, let's play that, let's do that, let's water down our message, let's not teach them about hell. When's the last time you heard a good message about hell? You listen to TV speakers or radios or, or whatever where you hear a message. When's the last time you heard a good message about hell? The Lord Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. People need to know hell is real. As I tell people that I meet, you're going to live forever in one of two places, either heaven or hell. You're not going to die and it's over with. You're going to live forever in hell. And it's not a place I want anybody to go. And it's not a place that was designed for us. It was created for Satan and his fallen angel or demons. But let's bend the truth. Let's get some more people in. Let's get some, as they say, butts in the seats. You know, that'll make us look better, make us look bigger. That's not what the Lord wants. The Lord's not interested in numbers. He's interested in hearts. 
genuine converted true hearts that are given to him. Compromise is always wrong. I'll repeat that one more time. Compromise is always wrong. The Lord never compromised. His disciples never compromised the truth. Most of his disciples were killed for the truth. Most of the early Christians were killed. Horrible deaths, fed the lions, lit on fire, and any other death that they could think they could do to a Christian. And it's happening around the world. Thank God that we in America aren't under that yet. I pray we never are. Maybe we will before the Lord comes. I don't know. Will you compromise the truth when somebody's standing with a gun to your head? Or a hangman's noose around your neck? Will you stand for the truth then, or will you compromise it and say, okay, well, yeah, we can do that? It's easy to stand for the truth here. It's easy to stand for the truth among other believers. Sometimes it's the hardest to stand for a truth around unbelieving family members. Strangers, who cares? You know, I don't really care what they think, right? That's the attitude. But family members, you care, and they know you. Do you always stand for the truth? Sometimes that's the hardest to do. But it's something God calls us to do. He doesn't calls us to do it. He commands us to do it. And what God commands, I would suggest we obey, because God does judge Christians also. We know this. Whether her name was really Jezebel, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Ryrie writes it's probably, you know, just a name that they use because it signified evil in the Old Testament. It could have been any other lady's name. I don't know. The Bible says Jezebel, so I believe it to be Jezebel. I take the Bible literally every possible way I can. Is her name Jezebel? Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't stand on and beat you over the head if you didn't believe me about that. That's up, that's up to you to believe. But we know it's someone who is leading people astray, leading them to evil. The Bible clearly states in two passages that women are not to teach or have a position of authority over men. That's not my words. That's not something that I came up with or the Apostle Paul came up with. As some people like to say, oh, that's just Paul doing it back then. Cause... No, that's the Lord's command. There's a reason for it. I don't know what the reason is. But that's the Lord's reason. And if he says to do it, I suggest that we do it. Some of your neighbors, some of your, let's call them carnally minded Christians or hangers on, well, ask, is sexual immorality really that bad? Come on, everybody's doing it. Is it really that bad? I've heard several Christian counselors in assemblies that a couple goes to marriage counseling and the counselor is shocked to find out they're already living together. <coughs> and these are supposed Christians in an assembly? You would think they would know better. But it's the way of the world. They let that little bit in. You know what? God understands my situation, so it's okay. No, he doesn't. He understands one thing. He understands you're sinning and you're living in sin. That's what he understands. So don't think it's just non-believers or people outside of the church who sin because it's not. People were stoned in the Old Testament for sexual immorality. Now they're praised for it. Somebody, if you know, please explain to me how you're courageous for coming out as a pervert. Somebody explain that one to me one day because I don't understand it. I never will. And it's okay to have five or six different wives. I, I don't understand it. But that's what they do. But sex outside of marriage, it doesn't just hurt. Immorality doesn't just hurt the two people involved. Think about the other spouses, the children, their families, their extended families. In the case of a Christian, a testimony. How many churches have been torn apart because their pastor had an affair with one of the parishioners? Or two people in, in the congregation had an affair and the church split because each one went with one or the other, either the wife or the husband. It can lead to unwanted pregnancies. And what does unwanted pregnancies lead to in this country? We're the capital of the world in it. I call it murder, but it's called abortion. So sexual immorality is never right. But yet, that's what they're practicing here. The Lord is warning us about it for a reason. 
Granted, I understand most of us in here are old and we're settled in our ways and we have grandchildren and all that. Don't think you can't be tempted. The enemy knows how to get you. And it's parading around in front of you everywhere you go. What's the old saying? Sex sells. It's on TV. It's in a grocery store. It's on the advertisements you see driving down the road. This lady was teaching them it was okay to lower oneself to the world standards. Let's fit into the crowd so we don't make any waves. Kind of like some of these TV pastors. Don't tell them anything they don't want to hear. Don't tell them anything that might convict them of their sin. Convict them that they're wrong. Well, how can you possibly be saved if you don't know you're lost? If there's no speed limit, how are you going to know you're speeding? And trust me, there's some stretches of highway here. I haven't seen the sign in them. Once I see the sign, I said, oops, let me break it back down. My wife will tell you that. I, I can do that, but I didn't see the sign. And there's, remember, speed limit signs are just suggestions anyway, right? You know, it sounds funny, right? But I was joking, but that's what compromise is. That's compromising. And that's what we do in our Christian life. It's so subtly like that. Well, everybody else is speeding. Let's keep up with traffic. We can do that in our own lives, too. And we do far too often. God tells us to stand firm. Never compromise our belief. I speak from experience on this one. Once you give in, it gets easier and easier and easier. And then all of a sudden, you're living a life that your neighbor could not tell you if you're a Christian or not. I have all of you know I used to play golf before I get sick. I used to play golf probably five days a week. And you, I couldn't t count the number of men I would be out there, and I would always get a chance to say something about the Lord in there. Oh, yeah, I'm mean, this and that. And then I'd listen to them and watch them and hear them, and I would be thinking, if I was a Christian, if I wasn't a Christian, I wouldn't want to be like that guy. But yet he's claiming to be a Christian. Are people looking at you the same way? Are they? They might be. What do your neighbors think of you? Do they know you as the good old boy next door who will have a beer with me every now and then? Who will laugh at my jokes? Or are you thinking you're the man that tells them about the Lord Jesus Christ? You're one who, as was said so eloquently this morning and so earnestly, are you the light shining in the darkness? Are you the light on top of a hill? That's what we're supposed to be. But once you compromise, guess what? Everybody saw you. They're watching you. They may not be listening to you, but they're watching you. The minute you compromise, your testimony's gone. They no longer will pay any attention to you because they won't want what you have. How many times have you heard, I don't go to church because they're just a bunch of hypocrites? I've heard that from my own family members. Thank goodness that they have come back to the Lord. But it was, it was a shock to hear it. It's interesting if you compare the churches at Ephesus and Thyatira. The Ephesians church was weakening or losing its first love. But they were faithful in judging false teachers. The church at Thyatira was growing in their love, but they were extremely tolerant of false teaching. Is either one of them better than the other? Is either one of them good? No. Extremes, in this case, you don't want either one. We are to speak the truth in love. We are never to compromise or waver it, but we're not to stand there and yell at them and beat them over the head and tell them how just rotten, and, you know. The Lord will show them that they're rotten. We just need to point them to the Lord for that to happen. And yelling at them and being firm at them and scolding them and, and you know, reprimanding them, well, that doesn't work. All parents know that, right? Well, to teenagers, I should say, because little kids, yeah, you can do that. Teenagers, not so much. Unloving doctrine and loving compromise are both hateful to God. What is in the letter to Ephesus, the letter to 
Laodicea that we will get to. What does the Lord say he does to a lukewarm church, to lukewarm Christians, compromising Christians? What does he do? Some of your versions say vomit you out of his mouth. Some of it say spew you out of his mouth. Some of it say spit you out of his mouth. But it doesn't it all mean the same thing. He's getting rid of it. He doesn't want it. You're expelling what you don't want. When you vomit or spit or spew something, you don't go down and pick it back up and put it back in your mouth, do you? No. It's something you don't want. And the Lord doesn't want that. It's hateful to him. He'd rather have you be cold than lukewarm. But we all need to be hot. How many of us are still on fire for the Lord? But we do need to speak the truth in love. But verse 21 sums up the Lord's grace and his mercy. He gave her time to repent. He gave this evil, wicked lady time to repent. But what's the problem with that one? She didn't want to repent. She didn't want to stop doing what she was doing wrong. The same way out here. They don't want to stop. God is a God of a million chances. I mean, how many chances has the Lord given you? Think about it. Those of us who are older have sinned a lot more than some of these younger people. And if anybody says they don't sin every day in their life, talk to me later because you just lied to me. So we'll get you going on that sin, okay? He's a God of a million chances. God is, all throughout Scripture, God is very slow to judge. But how fast is he to forgive and restore? He doesn't just forgive you, he restores you. I know when I came back to the Lord, my mom sent me a verse, I believe it's in Joel, I will restore the years the locust have eaten. The Lord could still use me. Though I strayed, he could still use me. He didn't give up on me. My mom gave up on me because she gave me to the Lord. So I just gave you to him and let him deal with you. But her, she never gave up on me as far as not talking to me or giving me a chance. None of that. That's not what I mean. She gave me to the Lord so the Lord could deal with me in his way. And that's sometimes what we as parents or grandparents have to do. We need to get out of God's way. Let him deal with the sinner. He gave her time to repent. How many of you here were saved the very first time you heard the gospel? That might be one or two. That might be one or two that you know that were saved the first time. Most of us heard the gospel how many times before the light bulb went off? God is a God of a million chances. His grace and mercy, I guarantee you, you will never reach the end of it. You can't reach the end of it. It was read this morning that his love is forever. It never goes away. You can't. It's, we, we don't understand the depths of it. If you think of the universe, how big the universe is, well, God's love made that, so God's love has to be bigger than the universe. And that's just in something that we can imagine what the physical si or the size of it is. God's love is unfathomable. We can't comprehend it. I doubt if we ever will be able to. But I give you no greater example than what the Lord Jesus Christ did at the cross. He went there and died for me. The chief among sinners, the world's worst, he died for me. When I was in Sunday school or maybe vacation Bible school, we were taught John 3, 16, for God so loved David Welsher that he gave his only begotten son so that David Welsher would have everlasting life and not perish. Makes it a little more personal that way, doesn't it? He loved me that much. How can you possibly compromise on that? People don't need to be lost. They choose to be lost. How many times in Revelation you got rocks falling on them, they're getting boils, they're getting... They're seeking death and can't find it. The sun is burning them. The darkness, they can't see anything. And what are they doing? They're shaking their fists at God. They know it's him. They're shaking their fists at him rather than repenting. God is not going to populate heaven with those who don't want to go there. But I guarantee you don't want to go to the other place. I guarantee that. 
But people need to know they're going to go to one of two places. Life doesn't end. It's, go to Romans chapter 1. You know, so often I've heard people say, oh, you know, God is love, he's this, and he wouldn't do that. You know, these people never knew, they didn't have a chance. Romans 1, verse 18 through 23, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. No one will stand before God and say, I didn't know. Oh, yes, you did. God gave you a chance. I will say this, the more you seek him, the more you will find him. But the Bible tells you, you must seek him with your whole heart. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. You have to be real about seeking the Lord. It's not a get out of jail free card like a monopoly that you can use whenever you want to and don't do it any other time. A lot of people like to pick and choose what they believe in the Bible and how to live their life. That's not, that's not the way it works. The truth is the truth and it's absolute. We in this world, not we, but the world has gotten to the point where truth is not absolute anymore. It's relative. It's whatever you feel like making it the truth. Well, jump out of an airplane without a parachute and tell me how the truth of gravity works. It works every single time. You put your hand in fire, you will get burnt every single time. Truth is absolute, but the world has made it whatever you want it to be. Two and two is 12, and that's okay. That's where this country is headed. That's where this world is headed. It's so sad to know where they're headed. You know, Revelation 21.8 talks about the cowardly and the unbelieving are the first two people listed that I will be in the lake of fire. And that's before murderers and adulterers and liars and everything else. Cowardly, those who won't stand up for Jesus Christ because they're afraid what the world thinks. And those who unbelieve. All unbelievers, there will be no second chance. You're not going to be able to say, I did not know. You know, I talk to people out you know, on the street, and they say, well, you know what? I'm going to surprise you in a couple of years after I get my life in order. And all I can say is, you'll never get your life in order. You can't. Reformation means nothing. Washing the outside of my body means nothing if I have a cancer on the inside. Reformation is what's needed. <laughs> Regeneration is what's needed. And that only comes by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's no other way. You must be born again, born from within. You can wash the body all you want to. You can quit drinking and quit smoking, quit doing whatever you want to do. That's not going to get you to heaven. You should want to do those things when you trust the Lord as your Savior, simply because that's what he wants you to do, and he wants you to live a life that's pleasing to him. But doing those alone without trusting him as your Savior does you no good. The Lord's strongest accusation, though, is not against her sin. As serious as they are, his accusation mainly is against her refusal to repent. He knows we're going to sin, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hard to believe that knowing what he knew about me, he still went to the cross and suffered. By the way, he went to the cross for Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and all those other people, too. He went to the cross for the people that crucified him. He needs them to repent. That's his biggest accusation in this letter. He gave her time. Gave her plenty of time to repent. She didn't do it. How long did the Lord give the world when Noah was building the ark? 120 years it took him to build that ark. God withheld judgment till then. But what happened when he allowed judgment to come? It wiped out everybody. And that's coming again at the second coming of Christ. She will be thrown out of bed of sickness. Out of bed she had sinned and out of bed she would suffer. You reap what you sow. Does that sound familiar? 
because she's getting exactly what she asked for, and so will every one of us. You know, if you sow corn, you don't grow beef. If you sow compromise, your testimony will be compromised. Remember in Corinthians, those whose testimony was bad in the church, the Lord took home early. They got sick and died. Don't think that can't happen to you or your neighbor or someone else. It can. It did, and it can. And it says, those who commit adultery with her will be thrown into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. It's their unwillingness to repent. What grace, what mercy. And one of my, I guess, choice words in, in the King James Version of the Bible is long-suffering, because I don't think patience covers it when it comes to me. I think the Lord has been very long-suffering with me. What he did for me and what I've done to him and what I continue to do to him, maybe not in actions but in thoughts or in my mind or whatever comes to, whenever someone comes to me and I brush them off instead of taking the time to, that person wasn't an interruption, that person was an opportunity, and I didn't take it. The Lord didn't do that for me. He was there every single second I needed him, and he'll be there every single second I need him every day of my life. And he will give me exactly what I need. But yet I can turn people away. Because you know what? I'm busy doing something. I'm having a bad day. Talk to me later. You know, we talked about this already. I don't want to hear it anymore. That's not the attitude he wants. The Lord is... And earlier in Revelation, it says the Lord is walking among the churches, and he judges and punishes evil. <clears throat> but if he offers forgiveness to those who repent, it's not just unbelievers who need to repent, people. Each one of us that has an unconfessed sin, our relationship is broken with the Lord. When you're, I've used this example before. When your child does something wrong, until they come and apologize or admit they did it, there's kind of a strain in your relationship, right? They're still your son or daughter, but there's a strain in that relationship. It's the same way with Christians not repenting of the sins they've committed since they've been saved. Yes, our sins are forgiven. We will go to heaven. We can never lose our salvation. We know that. But our relationship, our, our fellowship with the Lord is broken. Our, our relationship is solid. We can't change that. We can't change our position. That's where we are. But how much joy are you missing out on by not being walking in perfect fellowship with him here on this earth? When did you receive eternal life? Is that something you're going to get when you die and go to heaven? Or is that something you received the instant you trusted Jesus as your Savior? The little children, I write this to you that ye may know you have eternal life. Not you're going to get it. You have it. Are you enjoying it now today? If you're not, that's on you. We're running out of time, and I've been talking way too much. I'm sorry. What it says, the judgment on these women and children will be so dramatic, so very clear, that all the churches, all the churches will know that it's Jesus Christ judging them. You might say, well, how would they know? They're, you know? They don't have a telephone back then or internet or any of that stuff. Well, word of mouth, these letters were read or spread around to every church. They would find out, and if God says he makes it that clear, he'll make it that clear. When God makes something clear in your life, is there any doubt in your mind? No. When he makes it clear, sometimes he has to use a two-by-four to hit me with, but he makes it really clear. I wish sometimes I heard that little still, still voice a little bit quicker. I maybe wouldn't have to learn it's quite so hard. But I learn it one way or the other. We can't hide anything from the Lord. We just can't do it. He searches the minds and the hearts. Verse 23, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. You're going to get what you sowed. Be you be a Christian or be you not Christian. If you're not a Christian, you know where you're going. If you are a Christian, you just will miss out on the fellowship and the joy here on this earth. But your home will still be in heaven. Verse 24, but I say to you 
The rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. As far as I know, this is the first promise of his coming in the book of Revelation. He's coming back for us. John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. We talked about that in Breaking of Bread. The Lord is coming back for his people. How is he going to find you? Are you going to be ashamed when he comes? Are you going to be left behind? If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have not asked him and him alone to forgive you a sin, if you haven't come to him for that, you will be left behind, and you will suffer the tribulation that is coming upon this world. I don't wish that on anybody. You think the world is bad now? You think inner city Chicago or New York is bad now? You think Iraq or Afghanistan, any of those places is bad now? You think Gaza is bad now? It's nothing compared to what they're going to have during the tribulation. Nothing. That should spur us to get out there and tell others. It says, he who overcomes, as we said before, what's an overcomer? How do you overcome? You trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. An overcomer is not a super believer. It's just someone who has placed his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and is living a life that is pleasing to him. Not pleasing to the world, pleasing to him. It's hard to do sometimes. Young people, it's hard. But man, it's worth it. I look back in the times I wasted in the opportunity. Don't get there. Don't let that happen to you. Ask your parents if you don't believe me. Ask your grandparents. Ask your buddy, whoever. Ask them. They'll tell you. If they're honest, they'll tell you. Because there's not one of us here that doesn't have regrets and missed opportunities we could have done for the Lord. Times that we maybe even shamed him. Probably guaranteed we shamed him because we didn't obey him. We didn't honor him. We didn't give him his due place. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deed keeps my, keeps and he who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give authority over the nations. He's talking about ruling with him during the millennium. We the church, his bride, he's coming for us. We call that the rapture, as we all know. It's, the word is not in the Bible, but the doctrine is there. We will rule with him. Well, how are you going to rule with him if you don't obey him here? You know, if, if your boss gives you some, you know, a, a couple of employees to rule over, don't you think you better do it the boss's way or you're going to be the one that's at the bottom of the list and they're going to be bossing you instead? So if you can't obey the rules now, what makes you think you obey them then? Well, let's say... You'll be able to because you'll be perfect, but will you have the desire and the will if you don't have it here? You'll, you will reap what you sow. The Bible says that in many places. And I will give them the morning star. What is the morning star? Well, it's the star that comes up at the darkest part of the night, right before the sun shines. It's also Jesus Christ. I'll get, let you pick which one that is. Is he talking about the rapture here? Or is he talking about himself? It's interesting, in this one it ends, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All the other letters, all the other letters, it's he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, and then it follows with he who overcomes. But now in this letter and the next three, it's he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Bill McDonald writes, I don't know whether he's right or wrong on this, but he writes, this may mean from this point on that only those who overcome are expected to be able to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I believe that to be true from day one. Because unless the Holy Spirit opens your heart, opens your mind to God's Word, you're not going to get it. You're not going to understand it. How many of you ever started reading the Bible without praying to ask the Holy Spirit to enlighten you and give you wisdom on what you're reading? Every Emmaus correspondence book and every student that went to Emmaus would probably had it drilled into his head, pray that God will open your eyes before you start reading or before you start studying. It's a good habit to get into. Praying before you do anything is a good habit. 
Bible says pray without ceasing. Is there any time or reason you can't pray? Don't close your eyes while you're on the freeway, but you can be praying with your eyes open driving down the road. Trust me, I often do. And usually I'm asking for forgiveness for the guy that just cut me off. <laughs> it happens. I'm compromised. He cut me off. My selfishness rose to the top. My old sinful nature jumped up. It happens. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Are you listening? Are you hearing? Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Just for the many instructions and examples and guidance that you give us throughout your word. Father, thank you that we have the finished word. But Father, we also have the living word. And he lives within each and every one of us who has trusted him as our Savior. We're so grateful and thankful for that, Father. May we never compromise anything that concerns you. May we never compromise our walk, our talk, our thoughts, anything, Father. May we make each and every one captive to your will. Father, thank you that he who lives in, within us is greater than he who is in the world. We're grateful that we're not left alone, Father. You're here with us, guiding us, protecting us, and keeping us. We're not kept by ourselves, but we're kept by your power. Protect us now as we go out into this world, Father. Give us strength. Give us courage. But, Father, give us a great joy knowing who we serve and who we love. May we look for opportunities to share your Son, our Savior, with the world. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.